if you'd take the Word of God tonight and turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 2. And I think our Bibles just naturally fall open to this particular portion of Scripture at this time of year. But I want to take you just beyond the birth of Christ about 40 days. And I appreciate the opportunity the pastor has given me to share a thought with you tonight. And I'll do my very best to be brief and give you something to take with you from the Word of God. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 25. Uh, Joseph and Mary have arrived in Jerusalem. They are at the temple. They are dedicating the Christ child and going through all the ceremonial purification. And the Bible says in verse number 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God. And said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. I'd like you to take a pen tonight and mark a phrase in verse number 38. It's a fascinating phrase to me. The Bible says, all them that looked for redemption. We get the idea that everybody missed him. Nobody, nobody recognized the Messiah because the Bible says that he came into his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I submit to you that everybody didn't miss him because there was a group of people in Jerusalem living at the time of Christ incarnation that were anxiously awaiting his arrival. As a matter of fact, they had lived their entire lifetime for one moment, and that was the moment they were going to see Jesus Christ. Simeon expressed it this way. When he finally saw the Lord and held that baby in his arms, he said, I can die now. All is well. I have fulfilled everything I lived for. Tradition says... He was perhaps approaching 113 years of age. Can you imagine living 113 years? And he said, my whole life has been for one moment, and that was to see the salvation God promised. And Lord, it would be all right if I just died tonight because this is the pinnacle for me. Amen. Well, I want you to know, if you're a Christian, you are living your entire life for one moment. You see... Christmas is not just about a babe in a manger. As a matter of fact, in recent years, Christmas has come to mean so much to me in regards to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I noticed even in Pastor's Christmas card this year a reminder to, to our church family about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And, and it just stirred my heart again because as surely as Jesus Christ came the first time and people saw him, he is coming again and somebody's going to be alive on planet earth when he comes, it may be us. We may be the ones like Simeon and Anna that get to see him face to face. Whether we die and see him at that moment or whether we're here when the rapture takes place, either way, we're all living our entire life. I doubt it will be 113 years, but we're living our entire life for one moment, and that's the moment we're going to see the Lord Jesus. Now, of all the thousands of people living in Jerusalem, the Bible says there was a man in Jerusalem 
whose name was Simeon. Simeon was a fairly famous name. I imagine there were a lot of men in Jerusalem by the name of Simeon, but there was one man that stood out to the Lord, though perhaps no one else made much, much attention to him. God knew exactly who he was. And there was a woman in Jerusalem. Her name was Anna. And these two aged people were a part of God's holy remnant. May I remind you, church, that no matter how dark the world gets and no matter how bad the evil seems to be, God Almighty always has a people and he is fulfilling his purpose in their lives. And I don't know about you, but when I watch the news in recent days, I just take heart again. I belong to Jesus. He belongs to me. And even when the world seems like it is spinning in chaos, out of control, I am reminded that my God is still on the throne. And at any moment, I could see him. I want you to imagine something for a moment. I want you to imagine you're the last generation living on this planet when Jesus comes back. The truth of the matter is, it may not be imagination. We may very well be the last generation living when Jesus comes. Now, you want to talk about a Christmas. Can you imagine what it would be like this Christmas if this was the Christmas Jesus came? I'd be content to miss my mother's cooking, I think, and that's saying a lot, if Jesus would come. Because the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to beat anything Mama ever fixed. And look, being together with God's family in heaven, can you imagine what it's going to be like that first Christmas where we all gather around the throne of God and join in with the saints of all the ages and say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. That's going to be quite a Christmas. Well, I want you to know, I believe God gave us a glimpse into what our generation is supposed to look like by looking at the generation that was looking for him the first time he came. Why does God tell us about Simeon? Why does God tell us anything about Anna? I mean, these, these, are, not, these are not people, it seems, that stand out in, in the history of time and the annals of the ages. Why does God emphasize them? Because there was something in their lives that was so full of faith and anticipation. And God says, that's my people. That's my remnant. That's, that's what my children look like. It's interesting, but when you study the period of time leading up to the coming of Christ, it was a dark day. How many of you know we're living in a dark hour? They were living in a dark hour. Caesar was not a godly man. And Herod, Herod was anything but a moral man. And morals, morals were gone. Rome was in. Government ruled over the people. Sound familiar? The world seemed like it was crumbling. All the roads were being built and the language was being was being consolidated and, and financially they were doing all right in certain parts of the world. But from the perspective of a believer, you'd just come through 400 years where there had not been a prophet saying, Thus saith the Lord. 400 of the darkest years in Israel's history. 400 years with no light. And at that moment, Jesus steps onto the pages of human history. And there was a group of people alive that were looking for him. It's interesting, but some of the Jews during this period of time, they were, they were antagonistic towards Rome so much so that they were the zealots and they were trying to stir up the people and get a rebellion going. Now, this is fascinating to me. You do not find Jesus appearing to the rebels. You see, there was another group of people. You read history, there was a group of people that many historians have referred to in the words of Psalm 35, verse 20, they refer to them as the quiet in the land. What a term. The quiet in the land. And I submit to you, Simeon and Anna were a part of the quiet in the land. In, in an age where there was a lot of noise and, and there was a lot going on, there was a group of people, if you looked at them, you wouldn't have thought much of them, but they had a peace about them. There was, a, there was a quiet in their souls because they had learned how to rest in the Lord. They were living every day, eyes wide open, looking for Messiah. And then one day, Simeon comes walking into the temple and the Holy Ghost says, that's him. And I tell you, this wicked world we're living in, spinning out of control, needs some quiet in the land. And you know where it's going to come from? It's going to come from some God-fearing people 
who are not living wringing their hands with how bad the world is and how wicked Herod is and how terrible Rome is, but we're living our life with all eyes on the skies expecting the imminent return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I submit to you that kind of faith and that kind of expectation brings a quiet to your soul. It brings rest in troubled times. We need this quiet in the land. What are the characteristics of these people? Let's walk through it quickly. Notice what the Bible says about Simeon in verse 25. The Bible says there was a man whose name was Simeon. The same man, number one, was just. The word just means upright. Can I tell you, if you're going to be a part of the quiet in the land, if you're going to be a part of the people who are ready when Jesus returns again, number one, you've got to be right with God. Certainly, I mean by that you need to be saved. If you're not a believer, this is the day. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait till it's too late. I talked to a woman today and asked her about her soul and, and she said she knew the Lord and I, I can only go by what she said but she, she seemed to be so troubled, so little peace. Look, do you have peace with God? And then it's more than simply being saved. I would ask you, Christian, would you look at me just a moment? Are you thoroughly right with God? If I told you Jesus was coming in five minutes, what would you do in the next five minutes? Is there any sin the Holy Spirit puts his finger on right now and says, that's not right? Is there anything you would confess, anything you would forsake, any restitution you would make? Because if you're going to be the kind of person Jesus wants you to be when he comes back, number one, you've got to be right with God. Number two, the Bible says not only was he just, he was devout. That's a word that's used a lot today. We, we say that person's a, a devout Catholic or that person's a devout Muslim or that person's a devout Christian. It gets thrown around a lot, but here's what the word devout literally means. It literally means careful. Simeon was not only a believer, Simeon took care of his faith. He was careful about the way he lived his life. You know, I, we get so haphazard, don't we, about our prayer life. But we get so sloppy about our Bible study. We, we get so careless about our witnessing. Look, expectant people live careful Christian lives. Devout. They're not doing it for someone else. Look, there was no huge church patting Simeon on the back and saying, come on, buddy, you can do it. Simeon was living for an audience of one, and that was Messiah who was coming. He was right with God. He was careful about his faith. Look at the verse again. The Bible says, waiting for the consolation of Israel. We get the idea waiting means a guy slouches down the seat and just lays us around somewhere waiting on something to happen. That's not the kind of waiting. No, no. This is the waiting of earnest expectation. It's the waiting of an Anna that says, I'm looking. I'm looking for redemption in Israel. I'm looking for the one Isaiah promised 700 years ago. I'm looking. I can't wait. Look, if we live that way, it would change the way we live our lives. We spend a lot of time waiting. I read recently that the average human being spends five years of his life waiting in line somewhere. And all of you who've been Christmas shopping recently can say amen to that, right? The studies have shown that perhaps the average driver spends six months of his life waiting at a stoplight. I'm the most impatient driver on earth. And I say, you know, that's ridiculous, waiting at a stoplight. But I want you to know, there's one line I'm glad to be waiting in. Way up that line, there's an old man by the name of Simeon and an elderly woman by the name of Anna. And they were waiting. And look, I'm back in the line a little ways but I'm in a long line of people that are just waiting with expectation for the day I get to see Jesus face to face. What a day that will be. Amen. And then look at the verse again. The Bible says not only was he right with God, not only was he devout, not only was he waiting. I love this. The Holy Ghost was upon him. Now you have to understand the Old Testament economy, all the believers did not have the Holy Spirit like we do now. No, no, this is a man that lives so close to God. God said, I'm going to put my spirit on this man. I want to be such a man to live filled to overflowing, bubbling over with the Holy Spirit. And somebody gets around you and say, man, there's something different about that guy. Yes, it's the Holy Ghost of God. The Holy Ghost is on him. What are the marks of a Holy Spirit-filled man? Well, look at verse number 26. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. A Holy Spirit-filled man is somebody that is listening to the Holy Spirit. In tune with heaven, Vance Havner used to say. Not in tune with the media. Not in tune with the naysayers. No, no. In tune with the Holy Ghost of God. 
Verse 27, he came by the Spirit into the temple. You think that was by accident? You think that was a coincidence? No, my friend, that was a divine appointment. Wouldn't it be awful if Simeon had missed his divine appointment? But he didn't. You know why? Because he was walking in step with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you the most personal question I could ever ask you outside of your salvation. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit at this moment? Is there anything between you and God at this moment that is keeping you from being one with the Holy Ghost of God and being in tune with heaven? Because if there is, you need to deal with that before you stand before Jesus as shame. He could come at any moment. Look at this. The Bible says in verse 28, he took up Jesus in his arms and blessed God. One mark of people who are living with quiet rest and peace and faith in their heart is they know how to worship the Lord. You know, I've spent an awful lot of days asking God to bless me. Simeon didn't ask God to bless him. He blessed God. It'd be good this Christmas if we'd get our family around. Instead of saying, Lord, bless us, Lord, bless us, Lord. No, Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. What a Savior we have. What a heavenly Father we belong to. What a God we serve. That's the spirit of expectant people. Oh, but by the way, he not only knows how to talk to God, he knows how to talk to other people about God. Look at verse number 34, and Simeon blessed them. I've marked in my Bible in verse 28, he blessed God, and in verse 34, he blessed them. He blesses Joseph, and he blesses Mary. And it was just so natural to talk about the blessings of God and the goodness of God and witness about the Lord's faithfulness. Notice what Anna did. She does the same thing. Look at this woman. Thank God for godly women. Look at this woman in verse 37. She served God with fastings and prayer night and day. That's foreign, isn't it? And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise in the Lord. She blessed God and she blessed them. Spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Wouldn't it be great this Christmas if we determined to be bold witnesses again? To pass out gospel tracts and to tell people about the Lord and speak to people about their soul and not be ashamed of Jesus. Look, any moment, he's coming. Someday, the Holy Spirit is going to tear the veil away like he did for Simeon, and we're going to see him, not a little baby in arms, no, no, a king coming in all of his glory and splendor. And when he comes, we're going to be ashamed that we were not men and women like Simeon and Anna were. I'll give you one last thought about Simeon and Anna. One of the great secrets was they knew where the joy came from. It's interesting. You read nothing about either one of their accomplishments. We don't know what Simeon accomplished. We don't ever read that either one of them wrote a book, built a, built a great institution. We don't read any of that. They had learned that their joy came from one thing, and that was seeing Jesus and being with him. Wouldn't it be great in a world filled with a lot of negative things if we could learn to have that quiet in our hearts? Somebody would say, there's a man in Jerusalem. There's a, there's a people that meet down there on Beaver Creek Drive. They're different. They're happy Christians. There's a man I work with. There's a, there's a lady that lives across the street. They're different. I wish all of you could have been here a few nights ago for the Academy Christmas program. I, I love the Temple Baptist Academy, and I'm grateful that our, our children are a part of it. And it was powerful. It was beautiful. It was one of the greatest programs with the kids I've ever seen. They did a history of the carols, and one of them captured my attention. It was the story of Longfellow sitting in his study one night. His wife was in the next room over, cutting their little daughter's hair, trimming her hair, little Edith. Longfellow had a wonderful life, a beautiful home, beautiful wife, five lovely children. And while she's trimming the daughter's hair, some hot wax dripped on the wife's gown and caught it on fire. She rushed from the room and into his study and Longfellow did everything he could to get the fire out. He put a rug around her and tried to douse the flames, but he was too late. And by the next morning, she was gone. And Longfellow's joy went out. The light went out. Christmas rolled around that year. Longfellow wrote these words in his journal. The kids quoted it the other night. He said, how inexpressibly sad are all holidays. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people in this world thinking that same thing tonight. 
Another year goes by, and on the second Christmas, he writes in his journal, I can make no record of these days. Better leave them wrapped in silence. Perhaps someday God will give me peace. A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. That year, the Civil War broke out, and his son was sent off to war, and he received a message that his own son had been shot. His life is just, it's all crumbling around him. Finally, on Christmas Day, 1864, the light broke through. He realized that God was still on the throne. He took out a pen and a piece of paper that day and wrote these words. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. There's a lot of people singing that verse tonight. He paused for a moment and then with a smile wrote these words. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Can I gladly tell you tonight, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. And like Simeon and Anna, we can rest with quiet faith in God. Look, please, church. Jesus may come at any moment. Father, I thank you tonight for the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be a part of this church family. Lord, how special Christmas services are at this place. How sweet, how tender. Lord, I pray that you work deeply in our hearts so that we'll be the people you saved us to be and be ready when you come. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Do you know the Lord as your Savior? Are you certain of it? How many of you truly know the Lord? Would you raise your hand? Isn't it glorious? Would you keep your hand raised to heaven for a moment? The Bible says lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What a Savior. You may want to come tonight and just thank Jesus for saving you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand now. But there are some people here tonight who are not right with God. You may not be a Christian. Our workers are here along the front with a Bible. They'd love to show you how to have your sins forgiven. You may be a believer and... You just know there's something the Holy Ghost said tonight. That's you, that's you. This is the thing. And you need to come make it thoroughly right with God. What if this were your last night on earth? What if this Christmas you stood face to face with Jesus? What would you do differently tonight? Perhaps there's something in your life that is not what it ought to be. I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come find a place on your knees to tell the Lord, oh, may God help us to be godly men and women like Simeon and Anna.